Hello, welcome everyone to the third IEU virtual talk on the topic of healthy planet, healthy people, uh, looking at the global water cycle. We are very excited that you've joined us. My name is Yanji Kim and I am communications and editing associate at the Independent Evaluation Unit of the Green Climate Fund. I will be moderating uh, today's vir virtual talk featuring Dr. Anya Grobitsky. Uh, as some of you may know, we've had in-person lunch talks held in G Tower in Songdo, but due to the necessity of social distancing with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the IEU talks have gone virtual and hence the IEU virtual talks. The IEU's virtual talks feature leaders in international space and are a great venue for dialogue, exchange, and learning. We use the opportunity to increase understanding about the IEU of the GCF and then the GCF overall, while also raising awareness of diverse voices and streams of learning in the area of evaluation, especially as it relates to climate change and development. Today's talk will be a one hour session in total and uh, it will go until 5 p.m. KST. The session will be composed of a 25-minute presentation by our guest speaker, Dr. Anya Grovitsky, and a 30-minute Q&A session, which will be moderated. We encourage you to submit your questions through the Zoom uh, chat box during the talk, and we will try to get to as many questions as time allows. That said, uh, please allow me to introduce to you our distinguished speaker, Dr. Anya Grubitsky. Uh, Dr. Grubitsky currently serves as the Green Climate Fund's Deputy Director for Adaptation. And she, she's a global expert in anaerobic wastewater to energy conversion. She has nearly 40 years of engineering experience and she served as a former Executive Secretary of the Global Water Partnership based in Sweden. And she was also a former Deputy Secretary General of the Ramsar Convention on, on Wetlands. Dr. Gorbitsky received her PhD in Biochemical Engineering at Imperial College London. So without further ado, I would like to give it over to Dr. Anya Gorbitsky. And Anya, over to you. Thanks very much, Yonji. I hope everyone can see the screen now. And um, thank you so much to the Independent Evaluation Unit for this opportunity to present to you some of the findings of the sixth Global Environmental Outlook this was published last year by UN Environment. And you might get some idea of um, what this assessment was trying to achieve. This is the most comprehensive global assessment of the world's environment uh, based on a, a number of regional assessments that were done before this was completed. Uh, it, we are looking to put forward a vision of a sustainable world in 2050. And based on the five main environmental themes of air, land, freshwater, oceans, and biodiversity. So I'm not going to try to present all of it to you. We're going to be focusing on the evidence that was presented in the freshwater chapter. But I'd also just like to give you a flavor of what the report is trying to do. Um, it's an integrated and coherent view of the world's environment but it um, is not yet really systems focused. And we are hoping that in the seventh geo, which would be coming out then in four years time, that this will be much more systems focused. Um, it was a very rigorous scientific process that led to the, um, the putting together of this, um, this report. So, Many funders were supporting it, um, and of course, a number of partners, but it was a really large assessment, and I think that you might find this interesting. Um, gosh, I don't know why it's not moving on. There we go. So 146 authors altogether. I was one of the coordinating lead authors, and the total assessment was 700 pages. Um, but we also have produced a technical summary which puts this together in a hundred pages and I was also involved in the intergovernmental process developing the summary for policymakers, which is just 30 pages and that was adopted at the UN Environment Assembly last year in Nairobi. So if you'd like to have a really condensed view of um, the overall view of um, 
the world's environment right now in those five areas, I'd suggest that you have a look at that. So it's focused in three broad sections, um, the state and trends of each of these five biomes, the air, the land, the freshwater, oceans, and biodiversity. Then looking at policy responses, and finally a comprehensive outlook section that really tries to integrate the messages and look at where we need to be in 2030 and in 2050. So here you've got a slide of, of most of the authors, I think, and, and some of the intergovernmental reviewers as well. A very rigorous technical review process, as I'm sure IEU would appreciate. Um, and the intergovernmental review also was extremely rigorous. 364 intergovernmental reviewers. This, the summary for policymakers was negotiated over, in fact, two meetings. Um, and I was part of that process. And I can tell you it was quite, quite an uphill struggle. Um, in some cases, the authors also having to discuss in terms of the way in which the messages are phrased. And I think it's going to be a very interesting process for GCF when we start to develop our um, sectoral guides for both mitigation sectors and adaptation sectors and having a consultation process for those. Um, I'm sure we're going to be seeing something of the same flavor of discussion um, taking place. I'd also just like to share with you the good news that in fact the GEO6 won the award for environmental science from the American Publishers Association. It's published by Cambridge University Press um, and I very much hope that you might after this talk have a look at, at picking it up online. So why have we selected the messages that we did select for fresh water? First of all, there's a focus on health. And this was somewhat prescient, of course, because this uh, whole assessment started back in um, 2018, in fact, 2017, um, long before COVID. But we're seeing now this message loud and clear that without a healthy planet, we're not going to have healthy people. And of course, fresh water is central to all of this because Without fresh water, it's very difficult to wash your hands and keep yourself uh, free of um, infection. The messages are strongly grounded in science with the most recent data and peer reviewed literature, but combing through literature from all the regions um, as well as the global literature. So uh, this was the reason for the process of the regional geos preceding the global geo. In this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the key risks and opportunities to freshwater. And really the key message that I hope I'll be able to prove to you today, and I hope that you'll come back with some questions on this because it's a really significant shift, is that we're now recognizing freshwater is simultaneously a global public good and a risk multiplier that's affecting both human and ecosystem health. You might be aware that the World Economic Forum carries out its um, global risk report each year. And for the last eight years, that the World Economic Forum's global risk report is based on perceptions. But um, I'd like to emphasize that the GEO6 is based on evidence. Um, and hence the fact that we have now made this shift to arguing that fresh water as a risk multiplier is very significant. So what is happening? We're seeing major changes in the global water cycle, which is really integrating all the interactions and impacts, both on land, in water, in, in the oceans, in the atmosphere. And all of these numerous interactions and impacts are adding up to an acceleration of the global water cycle. Um, we have both population growth and climate change as increasing uh, the water related risks. And I'll show you how both of those um, also disaggregate into the drivers of economic development, agriculture, deforestation, urbanization, transport corridors, land degradation. Um, how all of these can contribute to increasing these water-related risks. 
as you know, uh, as an example of these anthropogenic risks, we're seeing pathogens, toxic chemicals and plastics increasingly polluting fresh water in many of the regions with the downstream impacts on oceans. And of course, because of climate change. We're seeing, as the IPCC predicted back in 2008, we're seeing more frequent and more severe storms, floods, and droughts. The desertification of land is intensifying, rainfall patterns are changing, and the snow caps are melting. Um, it's interesting to note that approximately 70% of all fresh water is locked up in what we call the cryosphere, in other words, in the solid form of water. As the snow caps on the major mountain ranges are melting and the glaciers are melting, um, this sometimes in the short term is increasing water flows downstream, but in the long term, it's going to influence the water scarcity and livelihoods of many millions of people downstream from these snow capped mountains. So, a lot of this, of course, is related to um, the global temperature increase that we're seeing. That means that the global water cycle is accelerating because the water is driven by heat and temperature changes. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, perhaps to illustrate it by the uh, catastrophic shrinkage of Lake Chad that we've seen over the decades. I'm sure that you've seen satellite photos like this before um, with a similar catastrophe happening in the Aral Sea. In the case of Lake Chad, we've seen a loss of 90% of the surface area of this major freshwater inland water body. And when we look at the causes, we find that about 50% of the causes can be attributed to increased human water use and increased populations. But the other 50% is attributable to climate change. Um, this is leading to increased resource conflicts over land, water, and fisheries. There are many millions of people who live in the, the basin of Lake Chad with a number of countries around. Um, and indeed, millions of people's livelihoods are being affected. And GCF has a number of projects which aim to address some of these impacts. Um, but I'd like to talk here a little bit more about how the disappearance of a freshwater body like this drives changes in the local microclimate. So water has a very high heat capacity. And so the presence of a large water body acts to stabilize temperatures. The water is absorbing the heat during the day and it releases the heat at night. Um, so you're not getting such large diurnal fluctuations. As the water volume decreases, obviously, the water body is less able to play this sort of buffering role. And so you start seeing much larger temperature fluctuations. You're starting to get much higher extreme temperatures. Um, and then this becomes a reinforcing cycle. This also then leads to less rainfall because a warmer atmosphere above the water body is going to uh, take longer to, to be able to produce rain. Sometimes that moisture laden air can get blown away and the rain would actually fall in another basin, not back in the basin where, uh, from where the, the water has evaporated. And so you start to get to see this, um, this positive reinforcement and, and a continuing ongoing shrinkage of the water body. Um, there are quite a lot of efforts to um, both to try to reestablish at least some of the areas of the water body to become viable and to address the accompanying resource conflicts. And this is, of course, a major adaptation task. So now I'd like to just move to looking at the global water security, uh, uh, scarcity. Um, and we can see in the map the countries that are affected worldwide by both physical water scarcity and economic water scarcity. So what you can see across much of sub-Saharan Africa in the dark color is actually economic water scarcity in the sense that many of these countries perhaps have sufficient water resources, but they have not had the investments to help them to develop 
the necessary uh, water storage and distribution networks for people to be able to access the water. And then, of course, there's a, a huge uh, population component to the increasing water scarcity um, in that as there are more people, the per capita availability of, of fresh water is decreasing. And um, these are the sort of elements that at GCF, when we receive a project that concerns water resources management, we need to disentangle the additionality of the climate change impact from the uh, population growth and development um, impact of, of using more water. So we're really um, seeing that as the global water crisis and the global climate emergency both accelerate, we're getting increasing risks of slow onset disasters, such as droughts and even famine due to climate change, but also in many cases due to mismanagement of water resources and yeah. poor governance issues. Um, as I mentioned before, we're seeing this driving greater resource competition reflected in some cases in conflict, but in many cases it's reflected in the food security, in spikes in food prices and um, effects also on, on the world food trade. So we're seeing that promoting water use efficiency, water recycling, water storage and rainwater harvesting are becoming increasingly important in many countries and the investments need to be made. Um, so this is one of the major policy messages and, and solutions messages coming through this report. I'd like to turn now to groundwater, which is the other major freshwater component of about 30%. If you remember that I mentioned um, that about 70% of the world's freshwater is locked up in ice and snow, uh, you'll see that in fact, the surface water that we have that is readily available in terms of lakes and rivers is a tiny percentage of the world's total fresh water. It's only about 0.3%. So the amount of groundwater that we have available worldwide is a whole order of magnitude larger, several orders, also orders of magnitude larger. And it's becoming increasingly important for many regions in terms of water security. Um, if you look at the graph, you can see this is tracking some of the major aquifers and the outstanding graph in terms of the, the volume of water extracted is in India, of course, in the Indo-Gangetic Plain. This uh, increasing groundwater abstraction has driven the green revolution in India. And it's a real question mark of to what extent it can be sustained um, because the abstraction levels in many areas are becoming unsustainable. But this is the case for other major aquifers worldwide as well. Um, aquifers are also threatened by pollution and also groundwater intrusion. Many of the pollution effects come from agriculture in terms of sort of diffuse pollution, um, the application of fertilizer and pesticides, but then, of course, you also still have many direct uh, pollution sources and issues such as siting um, waste dumps adjacent to an aquifer without sufficient lining and issues like that. Um, the groundwater is an absolutely key instrument for us to use in um, good water management. And so integrated surface and groundwater management, I think is, is really the watchword for the future. But we need much better monitoring and modeling of groundwater in order to support um, this new paradigm. Um, and we, we particularly need good groundwater governance and management. Up to now, water governance and management has been mainly focused on these rather small freshwater resources that we have. So the emerging work being done on international water law for groundwater is absolutely crucial in this situation. And particularly in the case of, of the large transboundary aquifers, um, such as in North Africa and elsewhere. Okay, I'd like to turn now to the issue of water use and efficiency. Um, 
see how my time is going. Oh my goodness, okay, I've got very little time left. Um, agriculture is still the predominant user of water globally, um, but there are many other water uses that are extremely important. What we're seeing though is that we're able to decouple water withdrawals from economic growth. In fact, we can decouple water withdrawals from water use by the means of a much more intensive water recycling and water reclamation. Um, so this is the main message that I'd like you to take away from this slide, which shows just how the total water withdrawals in the United States have been decreasing. Um, they, they reached a peak in about 1980 and they've been decreasing ever since. This is also the case for Europe. And although most other regions are still increasing in terms of water withdrawals, we hope that they will start to follow the same trajectory as this economic decoupling um, starts, to, starts to become evident. I really need to emphasize um, the basic issues of the sustainable development goals. Um, the good news that over 15 years from 2000 to 2015, one and a half billion people gained access to drink, drip, basic drinking water services. The flip side of this is, however, the bad news that we still, in 2020, have about 2.3 billion people who don't have access to safe sanitation. So that is one of the SDGs that is badly off track. It was the, the one of the MDG targets that was off track back in 2015, and it's still off track. Every year we have 1.4 million people who die from pathogen related diseases due to unsafe drinking water because of unsafe sanitation. And there's a gender dimension to this as well because the bulk of uh, water fetching in countries where the water distribution networks have not yet been sufficiently invested in falls on women and girls. And as you can see, women still spend 16 million hours per day collecting water in 25 sub-Saharan countries. Okay. Um, I'd not like to move to the messages on water quality. This water quality is unfortunately worsening worldwide. Um, in Latin America and Africa, in Asia and Pacific region, about 50% of US waters don't meet water quality standards. Fortunately, over the last 20 years, water quality in Europe has improved due to the Water Framework Directive of, of the EU, which is implemented very strongly. And there's a lot of investment going into it as well. As I mentioned, pathogens remain a major cause of human death and illness, particularly in developing countries. It has been estimated that the total global disease burden could be cut by 10% by proper investment in water supply and sanitation. And this was before COVID-19. So I can't emphasize enough that water is a sector where there's significantly underinvested still. And finally, the eutrophication associated with nutrients and climate change also leads to more frequent algal blooms because of the higher temperatures the cyanobacteria thrive in higher temperatures. We also find that mining causes acute water quality problems in many parts of the world. And if you've been admiring this photograph, it's actually the spill from a mine tailings dam that's affecting fresh water. I believe this is from the Tisha River in Hungary. Um, so very quickly, the pharmaceuticals, and personal care products, pesticides, antimicrobials, flame retardants, detergent metabolites, and then of course this massive area of the macro, micro and nanoplastics that are um, affecting waters worldwide. This particular graph or diagram is showing you the linkages in terms of pharmaceuticals um, coming both from people, the personal care products, coming into the sewage treatment plants. The bad news being that many of these emerging water contaminants are not currently removed by wastewater treatment technologies being used in the majority of wastewater treatment plants. Um, and so this is really becoming a, a huge global risk factor. We're seeing the accumulation of endocrine disrupting compounds 
becoming more and more widely distributed through freshwater systems. These are basically hormonal compounds. If you think of the pill flushing through um, from large cities downstream, not being taken out, the sewage treatment plants, um, all of these kinds of hormones and endocrine, endocrine disruptors are um, increasing concentrations and affecting, for example, the feminization of fish populations. You're getting more and more fish populations um, having many more females rather than males because of the increased um, estrogen. There are also long-term impacts of human health. So not only in terms of it affecting male fertility in humans as well as in fish, but you also have long-term um, developmental impacts. For example, you see underdevelopment of human fetuses and child neurodevelopment is affected by these endocrine disrupting compounds. This is becoming a major focus of study and it's a case worldwide in developed countries as well as in developing countries, wherever these endocrine disrupting compounds are used. And finally, um, the bad news on water quality is that there, because of the increasing use of um, antimicrobials and antibiotics worldwide, both for people and for animals, for fish farms, it's, antibiotics are becoming very widely distributed in the freshwater system as well as in coastal waters. Um, and there, is, there are projections that these antimicrobial resistant infections are increasing and the illnesses due to them may become a main cause of death, a human death by 2050. So there are indeed a lot of severe risks to be taken into account above and beyond climate change. Let's talk about some of the other um, drivers of the, the risks in freshwater systems. Freshwater ecosystems are the most biodiverse of all ecosystem types and wetlands are very valuable natural infrastructures. But what this assessment has found is that freshwater ecosystems are disappearing very rapidly um, at three times the rate of forests. And in fact, to the extent that we're now finding 12% of all wetlands are in fact human made, uh, if you count up all the dams, reservoirs, ponds, paddy fields, and so on. Uh, to some extent, that's starting to counterbalance the loss of natural freshwater ecosystems. But nevertheless, the protection of these freshwater ecosystems is becoming a top, top priority for all the services that they provide. We've found over 40 years, about 35% of wetlands been lost and some 80% of freshwater species populations have declined compared to 36% of coastal and marine species populations. So in fact, the, the freshwater ecosystems are being the most strongly impacted. And then here's a related issue, very uh, important for, for climate change, is that peatlands as a form of wetland um, is actually a critical component of the carbon water cycle. In fact, peatlands contain at least the same amount of carbon as all the world's forests, if not more. Some assessments have indicated that it's up to twice as much carbon as all the world's forests. Emissions from drying of peatlands when they're being drained currently contribute about 5% of annual global carbon emissions. And we've found that about 15% of peatlands worldwide have been drained and more and more are actively being drained every day. The solution is fairly straightforward. Um, in technical terms, it's to re-wet the peatland so it turns from being a carbon source back into a carbon sink where peatlands are actually absorbing water, sorry, carbon from the atmosphere and capturing it. Peatlands are essentially young coal fields um, in many, many millions of years time that peat would become coal. But what we're doing is that we're destroying the world's peatlands at a very rapid rate. And this is a major issue for climate change. I'm now wrapping up. Um, Cortland, you'll be pleased to know. Um, so the major messages are that population growth is increasing water risks exacerbated by climate change. Water quality has increased, worsened significantly since 1990. 
and illnesses due to antimicrobial resistant infections that may become the main cause of death by 2050. I'd like to emphasize that these are the key messages that should be accepted and endorsed by the intergovernmental process of the UN Environmental Assembly. Um, we highlighted the good news that there has been progress in people's access to clean drinking water. Um, but we want to emphasize that freshwater ecosystems are very valuable natural infrastructure, but they're disappearing still at a very rapid rate. And the decomposition of peatlands is a major contributor to annual global carbon emissions. So very quickly on the key policy messages, we need to promote river basin management, catchment management and aquifer management, both better management as well as better governance in order to safeguard people's water security in the coming years. Water recycling, treatment and reuse are becoming increasingly important for pe vulnerable people's adaptation and resilience. But also if you look at the water balance in many, many areas. Um, there has to be a much greater investment in water recycling, treatment, and then the reuse possibilities. We need innovative and integrated policy mixes in order to manage these complex problems. But integrated water resources management, IWRM, is becoming a well-developed discipline that can provide a basis for planning across sectors. And of course, both the social equity considerations and the gender equality are key aspects in achieving the SDG 6 on water to ensure that no one is left behind as we strive to improve our water management and our water governance. So thank you very much and I'd love to answer any questions or hear your comments and views. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anya. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation and we already have a number of questions and comments received from the participants. So let me go through some of the questions we received. So the first question is about fresh water being a global public good and also a risk multiplier. So how would this affect future funding of water projects and what would this mean for the designing of DCF projects in particular? Anya, would you like to um, answer that question? Right. Um, yeah, thanks very much for that question. Um, so one of the issues that is always looked at very closely in adaptation projects is where the project is aiming to provide people with an increased drinking water supply. So it's not only water, say, for agriculture or for urban use, but um, actually as drinking water supply, that uh, there is um, the same amount of uh, emphasis is placed on the sanitation aspects because of this issue that water can become a risk multiplier. And so investment in providing people with more drinking water um, and this can particularly be an issue in more remote rural areas, that there does need to be that counterbalancing investment on the sanitation side in order to ensure people's safety and security. Um, on the, the pollution risks, this is something that GCF um, finds it difficult to invest in. So we tend to focus on the water risks related to water scarcity and water quantity, where there's a clear climate rationale for the way in which climate change is, is creating um, an increased water scarcity. As you saw in the example of Lake Chad, where it's clearly about 50% um, anthropogenic, but 50% from uh, climate change causes that, that the Lake Chad uh, water availability has changed. Um, I hope that answers the question. Would you like to come back on that? Sure, yes. Uh, thank you very much for your response. And then there was a question received uh, from Eben uh, on the process of writing the GO6 report. Um, as you kind of briefly mentioned, I'm sure it was a very complex uh, process trying to get the buy-in from uh, many of the governments. So could you, share any lessons learned from being part of such huge, a massive uh, writing process? 
really quickly. So I would say that really part of the challenge there comes from trying to um, agree on global messages. Of course, the regional geos had been through their regional processes and had identified the major regional risks in their freshwater systems. Um, then looking at the global evidence and trying to collate this all into a global overview was rather different because um, we had to really then focus on the risks which were the most widespread and, and that affected the largest numbers of people. So we had some issues where, for example, people could be upset that we were, uh, for example, they thought that we, we were neglecting the effects and the impacts of sandstorms and dust storms, which happens when you get increasing aridity, land degradation, loss of soil moisture, loss of, of water bodies. It's a huge problem in the Aral Sea region, for example. But dust storms and sandstorms are really much more of a sort of localized issue and of course, by its very nature, water is very context specific. So there are always people who are going to feel that a particular issue is the most important because that's what they see in their lake, in their catchment area, or that's really affecting them personally. Um, so it's distilling the global messages that have more of a universal um, impact that I think was quite tricky. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a comment from David. Uh, when we use the word health, uh, of course, we talk about uh, human health, but um, he thinks that ecosystem health uh, could also mean different. So can we find a better term uh, so that there is no ambiguity uh, you know, in using the term? Do you have any thoughts on this issue? Okay, well, of course, I mean, as, as an ecologist, one could use a lot of different terms such as you know um, ecosystem functions ecosystem services uh, ecological functioning um, but we felt that and this this was something that i think all the authors really subscribed to was that talking about ecosystem health and even planetary health is now extremely important because it is so tied up with human health and it's something that people can individually relate to and identify with and hence that we might find the policy messages strike more of a chord if we talk about ecosystem health and planetary health uh, in the context of this assessment and i think perhaps this has been reinforced even during the covid um, situation the COVID tragedy um, because of these very close linkages to to ecosystems and wildlife mm -hmm. so ecosystem health and human health is all interconnected yeah as you said so i think it's very fitting and then there was a question about groundwater has groundwater recharge became a uh, common measures to mitigate water scarcity issues in developing countries this was from astrid yes Yes, thank you very much for that question. Um, absolutely, we're getting some very interesting uh, groundwater recharge projects being proposed by different entities in different regions. Um, I think this is just so important. It's really the way to go. Um, and, you know, I, I would love to see a lot more thought going into this. Um, even on larger scales, we're tending to see it happening more on a small scale. There are a number of very successful pilots already worldwide, but we're starting to invest in larger size projects. But I think that, you know, this is an area that's, that's only going to grow and, and deserves a lot more investment. Uh, because underwater storage also makes a lot of sense um, that water is not as subject to pollution, it can be protected by you know, the aquifer protection uh, ground regulations in, above the aquifer um, is protected from evaporation. Um, it's just a, a very good way to go to actually use the natural aquifer storage that we're given in order to store water rather than building more um, artificial infrastructures to, to carry more surface water. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Uh, and then there were some questions regarding groundwater governance and management. Yes, you mentioned this. So uh, what can be done to improve the m and &E on groundwater governance and management? Uh, what are the bottlenecks of why monitoring hasn't been done so effectively? And another issue that's linked with that is uh, when it comes to groundwater governance, uh, do we have any instances of countries uh, going into conflict situations because of you know, governing these transboundary resources, for instance? Yeah, so maybe you could take those two questions together. Well, yeah, um, one of the bottlenecks certainly is simply the process of international water law. You know, it took something like 20 years for the UN Watercourses Convention to come into effect. And the, the groundwater law only started being drafted, um, I think, much more recently than the Watercourses Convention. So it's, it's simply a long process to, um, to get so many countries to come on board and, and to agree internationally. And then as you say, the, trans, the, the areas where there are transboundary aquifers are particularly, uh, shall we say, a possibility for conflict. Um, there's a lot that we still don't understand about groundwater. There needs to be a lot of investment in monitoring. We need to really understand the flow of groundwater, the, the rate of flow, what happens if groundwater is abstracted in one area and how much does that affect another area, which could be many, many kilometers away, but on the same large aquifer. Um, so all of these things on a particular aquifer would need to be negotiated. And it's so much harder if you think about how difficult transboundary water governance is on, on shared rivers, which you can see and people can very clearly see how much water is flowing if one country is retaining water upstream, for example, by building dams and what the impact is downstream. That's quite clearly visible. So a lot of people have a good idea of what it is they're negotiating that they're trying to reach agreement on. But in, case, in the case of groundwater, it's much more difficult to model. And then to get the technical results of that modeling across to the policymakers so they can understand what it is that they're actually negotiating over. Um, it's a young discipline. I think it's, it's growing very fast, uh, but again, it's, it's an area that needs substantially more investment and emphasis, I think, in terms of international water law. Um, but this is perhaps something that I, I see that our Director of External Affairs, Oyun, is online. And uh, Oyun has many years of experience in these issues. So perhaps, Oyun, if you'd like to comment on this as well. Yes, Oyun, are you there? Would you like to quickly come in on this point? I'm here, Anya. I was very carefully listening. I just got some urgent email. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and it was sort of overlapping. So sorry, uh, Anya, was it on? The groundwater governance. And the, the difficulty of the bottlenecks in, in establishing better groundwater governance and, and water transboundary water sharing from aquifers. Yes, no, I think it's a very, very complex and complicated issue, especially transboundary. And we still don't have very pro proper um, mechanism of on governance on that. So uh, I think it's very important to work on this. But definitely, um, it, uh, we, I think the, it, it's still a major missing point on the governance as well. I had a one a one question. I don't know whether Yonji, you will be reading, but maybe I'll, I'll I can just raise it here. Okay. You know, um, you mentioned, of course, very uh, correctly that seventy percent of all our water, fresh water, goes to produce food, right? And of course, um, that's going to go up with the increase in the population, but also in the consumption as well. And because one third of all the food is wasted globally, from farm to fork. And apparently one fourth of all the water that we use in agriculture is also lost with the food loss. So we have this huge uh, water scarcity, water security problem. At the same time, you know, when we're trying to come up with very state of the art, maybe technologies, how to save water, but there are also low hanging fruit. And that is if we reduce food loss and waste, we can be saving almost one fourth of all the water that we use to produce food of that 70%, right? 
So I think these are the type of things that we have to be very um, smart and aware of. And even within the GCF, probably, I was talking to Leo recently, how do we reduce, or how do we also introduce food loss and waste things within even GCF, within our events and board meetings, et cetera. Thanks, Anya. And yes. that's, also you. Thank that's also governance, right? Absolutely. But thank you for raising this issue of the embedded water in the products. Um, I know there's also a lot of thinking around the fashion industry, for example, how much water is embedded in fast fashion mm -hmm. and how people are starting to rethink what the fashion industry could do to stop this huge wastage of, of products and water that goes with it. But in terms of food waste, it's actually something that each one of us can contribute to. And I hope that one possibility is of the beneficial effects of this kind of lockdown experience of the COVID-19 experience has been that many people have been thinking a lot more about where their, what their food comes from, how they access that food, uh, supporting more local supply chains. And um, some economists are even talking about the disintegration of supply chains worldwide as a result of you know, the economic crisis that is now upon us. Um, but what we could see through the encouragement of um, national food security, which is certainly growing, the, the, the need for national food sovereignty um, and supporting local supply chains, that may actually lead to reducing food losses and waste along the way, along the, the trading chain and the the cold chain. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Oh, you, it, it was really good to see your face too. So if any of the participants want to also turn on their uh, video, uh, we would like to see your face as well and then have this more interactive discussion. So staying on the topic of uh, you know, farming, for instance, maybe you can answer this question from Lalita. Can artificial ponds and lakes curb the freshwater scarcity? Uh, can it be helpful in local agricultural farmlands? Yes, um, thanks very much for that question. Absolutely, I think small water storages are the way to go. Um, they're nowhere near as ecologically damaging as large reservoirs. They can actually help to increase local biodiv biodiversity and embedding small water storages, lakes, ponds um, within the landscape and taking a landscape approach to, to storing the water, preventing the water from running downstream, keeping it as much as possible on the land. Um, I think this is absolutely the way to go. And I think it, it, you know, one can do very interesting sort of modeling exercises to show how a large number of small storages compared to say one large dam can be a lot more beneficial in terms of the catchment, in terms of the water balance, and for the farmers as well, to have more direct access to that water. So indeed, in a lot of the adaptation projects that GCF is funding now, it's the, the funding of small water storages is, is a large part of that investment Great. for adaptation. Yeah. Um, and then, well, really quickly, can you comment on this uh, question, are there any mechanisms we know of or are being currently developed to improve wastewater treatment plants to also remove hormones? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> that's, a, um, that's a very key question. Mm -hmm. And removing um, antibiotics as well. This is what we call uh, refractory compounds. Um, in other words, they're compounds that are actually very difficult to break down. Most of the compounds in wastewater, one can break down either aerobically or anaerobically. If you break them down anaerobically, you can actually produce methane, capture that methane and produce energy. So that's the, the wastewater energy conversion that, that I've been working on for a lot of my life. But these refractory compounds are really hard work. Um, I think um, a major part of the investment right now has to go into source control and to try to stop these compounds as much as possible getting into the freshwater system in the first place. So for example, much stricter controls on how people use antibiotics and what they do with those antibiotics um, 
instead of flushing them down the toilet, that you actually have to return them to the pharmacy, for instance, that there's some sort of tracking process of how people use antibiotics in the way that farms use antibiotics, um, that, there's, that those antibiotics are, are kept on the farm and as much as possible in contained systems that can't get out into the freshwater system. Um, in aquaculture, keeping those fish farms really separate from the natural water system so that the antibiotics that people are feeding the fish doesn't get into the water cycle. You know, the sort of source control um, involves a lot of regulatory measures. It's a lot of behavior change, so it's very difficult. But at the moment, to be honest, um, you know, th there's a lot of effort going into that now through many, many governments worldwide, and also the FAO is doing a lot of work on, on these sorts of regulations. But um, in terms of wastewater treatment technologies, I think we're still a long way from finding the sort of technologies that are affordable uh, worldwide to be able to remove both the endocrine disrupting compounds, the hormones, and the antibiotics from our wastewater. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And the topic of gender, of course, came up during our presentation. So maybe we can quickly uh, you know, comment on this uh, topic. How does the water scarcity affect gender participation in development activities, uh, focusing on the sub-Saharan Africa countries, for instance? OK, thank you. Yeah, this is an absolutely critical issue. Um, I mean, women are, in practice, the main water managers for their families, in many cases for their family plots, for vegetable gardens. Um, they are not the main water decision makers in many cases. Um, there needs to be a lot more thought put into this issue of how do women actually get more access and control over water over the decisions that are made, over the investments that are made. Um, so GCF, fortunately, we have an incredible gender team um, that scrutinizes all the projects very carefully in terms of the gender action plan that's proposed to make sure that it's adequate, that women are going to be gaining more control over water investments. Uh, but we've just got such a long way to go in those terms um, so yeah, this, this is an area that, that needs a lot more work and deserves a lot more study because a lot of it is also tied to land tenure systems, to who owns the land, who controls the water on the land. Um, and of course it's, it's very context specific in each country, the, the social situation may be different. One of the things that we're seeing, um, is in some senses um, many more women headed households in, in agriculture on the small farms as men leave, migrate, go to the cities in search of work and or even else into the other countries. Um, so I think that um, also there's, you know, as, as there are an increased number of women coming into agriculture and coming into agricultural markets and for uh, helping women to get market access and market information is also indirectly a way of um, helping them to thereby get access to the agricultural water that, and, and to get access into the decision-making systems. Thank you very much, Anya. Uh, so we have a question from Tony. Tony would like to ask you a question directly. So Tony, would you like to come in now? Yes, thank you, Yonji. Uh, thank you, Anya. Uh, I have a question that, you know, uh, about uh, water as an economic good, um, as a as a means, and viewing it as an economic good as a means to addressing many of the issues which you uh, which you identify. You know, uh, wide ranging and growing in, in problem areas. You mentioned the uh, EU's water framework directive, which was about you know improving the quality of clean water, extending uh, sanitation, sewerage, and cleaning up the pollution. And the trick was not uh, in the UK, in my country, uh, the, the, the response to that was privatisation, certainly in England and Wales, um, as, a, as a means to raise the necessary capital to invest and, and improve the quality. Elsewhere in Europe, there are different solutions. So it's not about private or public. It's about viewing uh, water as an economic good. 
Um, uh, well, of course, it's a social good and a political good. And I, and I just in that context mentioned this great movie, which uh, uh, anybody interested in the water sector, uh, I would recommend uh, seeing. It's probably about uh, 15 years old. It's called Even the Rain. It's about the privatization of the water sector in uh, Bolivia. Um, but they got it wrong fundamentally in the movie because it's, you know, arguably they confuse privatization and the private sector with the, with the use of uh, water, you know, tariffs and uh, viewing water as an economic good. So, so the question is, uh, Anya, you know, uh, uh, is in your view uh, a key element in addressing many of these multiple issues, viewing water uh, as an economic good? Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Well, I think you've raised one of my favorite topics, which is water in the national economy, W-I-N-E, which also spells wine, um, turning water into wine. Um, certainly water is, is the, the lifeblood of every economy and every society. Um, all economic activity needs water, all people need water. 70% of our human bodies are actually made up of water. But, um, and water also is absolutely essential to make, to grow grapes and make good wine. Um, but seriously, you know, um, we need to value water much more highly. And in certain circumstances, the value is related to the price. You can say like um, Benjamin Franklin, that you only really know the value of water when the well is dry. But what we need to do is to learn to value water long before the well is dry and how to actually price it correctly so that there is equitable access to water, um, that the pricing mechanisms are right, that there are market signals sent out to the major water users. So to have, you know, step tariffs on water. So the greater your water use, the higher the tariff that you pay. But for example, as in South Africa, you can have a basic zero water tariff um, that actually guarantees 20 liters of water per person per day free to everyone in the entire country. And only after that do households start to pay for their water. So I think that there are a lot of issues related to the water price that can also be dealt with by, by regulatory measures, by the way in which water laws are framed. Um, but I, I would absolutely agree with you that, that there do, do also need to be water markets. Perhaps not going as far as they attempted to take the water markets in Australia, where farmers could be trading their water rights, and it still led to a huge collapse in the Murray-Darling Basin um, during a drought. But I think that, you know, this, this is such a huge part of the conversation that, that, well, thank you for raising it, that it needs to come in. It, I have to say that it wasn't a major part of the geo assessment, which was really focusing on the environmental state and trends of, of the freshwater system. Um, but it certainly deserves to be a part of, a, a key part of the major, of, of the, the basic uh, water conversation that people have around the issue of, of water scarcity. So thank you for raising that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you for coming in, Tony. Uh, it was good to hear from you directly. Uh, unless uh, we have any more burning questions from the participants, uh, I think we are you know, good to close now. Uh, but then there was a comment from Max and he was referring to the Ramsar Convention's Global Wetland Outlook from 2018. And he's saying that it's a very good resource and you can find it at www.ramsar.org. So thank you very much for that. Um, yes, do we have any last minute uh, burning questions before we close? Any questions for Anya? Will you be sharing your slides, Anya? <laughs> I'd be very happy to, um, if IEU could do that. You're, you're very welcome to put them up. And what I would 
do then is I would attach um, the links both to the global environmental outlook itself and the summary of policymakers. But Max, I promise I'll also attach the, um, the link for the global wetlands outlook, which of course we referred to a lot in the context of this assessment. Thank you for that. That will be very useful, thank you. Yes, also to add to that, uh, we will make available the recording of today's talk on YouTube, uh, the IEU's YouTube channel. And so you can see the slides as well as our discussion. So yes, it will be made accessible. And then just one last question from Katrina on desalinization. So she wants to hear from you, your thoughts on desalinization and then uh, maybe a response to fresh water scarcity. Oh, gosh. Um, okay, that's, that's a big topic. Um, it also depends which region you're talking about. But, um, of course, thermal desalinization and using, um, using fossil fuels to desalinize, to, to distill the water, essentially, which is what's happening in the Gulf, is absolutely not to be recommended. It's very highly um, energy uh, uh, intensive. It's, it's uh, yeah very high carbon emissions from doing that. The sweet spot in desalinization really comes from solar desalinization. And there are quite a few technologies now for solar desal, which have been applied very successfully on islands, for example, um, in, the, in the Mediterranean, in the Caribbean, there are quite a lot of solar desal outfits. Um, then you also have um, technologies such as reverse osmosis, which run on electricity and then of course it depends if you're running off dirty electricity or, or clean electricity on your grid um, the dirty electricity being you know fossil fuel power stations um, but desal can be very power intensive uh, sorry the uh, reverse osmosis can be a very uh, power energy intensive form of desalinization so i think you have to be very careful to look at the context to look at the power sources being used. Um, but having said that, in coastal areas, you know, desal can be a, a lifesaver um, for a lot of small and remote communities, vulnerable communities, and, and particularly in the island context. So thanks for raising that option. Okay, thank you. Just one last question from uh, Kaori. Uh, can you comment, Kaori? Uh, he or she has a burning question. Do you want to come in? Kaori? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. My name is Kaori Fusunagawa. I come um, from Okinawa, Japan. Um, in Okinawa, uh, People have uh, suffering uh, pollution from the U.S. military force, uh, which has a station about 75 years. Recently, we found that U.S. military force have polluted groundwater, which is a main water source for us with PFAS. These groundwater pollution by uh, foreign military forces, we can see sim similar program in South Korea and the Philippines and other Asian country too. I wonder uh, the, the UN report you uh, introduced today uh, covers the military polluted water pollution uh, and propose any policy to respond to this issue. Hmm. Hmm. No, thank you for raising that question. No, thank you for raising that question. Um, you know, as, as I said, could you switch off? As I said, could you switch off? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so groundwater pollution is, is a huge problem and partly because it's also quite difficult to prove. Um, but there are a lot of documented cases of groundwater pollution from um, aviation fuel happening around airfields. Um, it's very important, I would think, to analyze the groundwater to identify exactly what are the compounds that are in there and that to, to trace the source of those compounds. Um, and then, you know, there, um, there needs to be some sort of local or national groundwater law, which could be called upon um, in order to put sanctions on the polluters. 
So this is you know, a problem that relates to military installations, but it can also relate just as much to, to civilian airfields and indeed to many industries that can be polluting their local aquifers. So this is where the regulatory aspect of groundwater and the monitoring and the modeling becomes so important because you need to know what is polluting the aquifer, what the sources are, where they're coming from, and then where that pollution plume is heading to. So who are the people who are at risk from that pollution plume underground? Yeah, but thanks very much for that question. And good luck, I hope that you that you managed to make progress in, in fighting that, that groundwater pollution. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Kaori, as well, for asking that question. It just made us real out, realize how serious this issue can be. So, you know, how harmful it could be to our health and everything. So thank you very much for raising that question. All right, so we've had a very good discussion and a very good presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gorbitsky, Anya, many, many thanks to you. So with that, I think we are happy to close today's session. So a, a big round of applause for our distinguished speaker and also all our participants. Thank you very, very much. And as I mentioned, uh, this yeah, recording will be made available on YouTube. Yes, Anya, please say your uh, last. I just, um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Yonji, to IEU, and thank you to all the participants, um, and also for your for your wonderful questions and interaction. And I'd be very happy to to interact more if uh, people want to um, to ask further questions and to engage more on this. But we'll certainly make all the information available also after the talk. So thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. And we hope to have you join us next time again. And just to give you a little sneak peek, the IU virtual talks will uh, have two uh, sessions focusing on the key findings of the IU's two evaluations, looking at the GCF's accreditation function and also the simplified approval process, the so-called SAP. Uh, and so stay tuned and we will come back with uh, interesting stories uh, in the next episode. All right, thank you very much, everyone, and we will see you again soon.